Eric. Again, welcome everyone to World Oregon's virtual program with Sean Smallman. We are very excited to have him here today. Just a short introduction for his program on fear, fiction and fact, COVID-19's origins and spread. Sean is professor of international and global studies at Portland State University with a background of scholarly work in global health, particularly regarding HIV AIDS and avian influenza, indigenous history, health and religion, the global drug trade and global health, and conspiracy theories, among other areas. Pandemic in Latin America, which was based on research in Southern Mexico, Cuba, and Brazil. And he blogs regularly on global affairs at Introduction to Global Studies. And I know we have several folks in the PSU family uh, joining us today. We're excited about that. Uh, and this is obviously a very hot topic. Sean is going to uh, lay out some key points, debunk some myths. And after his presentation, we'll answer a Q&A from the audience through the chat function. Uh, so as soon as you wish, you may start entering questions. Uh, Tim DeRoche will be monitoring those. And after his presentation, we will go to those questions. So without further ado, uh, Sean. Great. Well, I really want to thank World Oregon, Derek, and Tim for uh, this opportunity to talk. And I want to start off by saying I, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. I'm a social scientist, and I have a real interest in uh, public policy and infectious disease. And I've been thinking about this for uh, a long time. And some of my thought really started because of my work with uh, HIV and Latin America that Derek referred to. When I was there, I was doing um, a lot of interviews. And so I would talk to um, all kinds of different people, health workers and doctors, nurses, drug users, drug traffickers. And one thing that kept coming up was that I was told over and over again that the United States was behind the HIV pandemic. And in fact, I was told that US pharmaceutical companies had found a cure for HIV AIDS, but they were not uh, uh, making that public because they were making too much money. And so I've been interested in kind of the stories that people tell about disease for a long time. And one of the things that I'll say about those stories is they do matter. If you look at what happened in South Africa between 1999 and about mm, 2008 maybe, there was HIV denialism and that really impacted how the entire country responded um, to HIV AIDS. So, Conspiracy theories and the stories that people tell matter. Um, I should also say I've been more recently doing work in Southeast Asia. In 2017, I was in China. I spent a lot of time uh, in wet markets there. And so I want to talk about that a little bit too, because wet markets are the most likely place for this virus to have begun. And you see a little bit about them in the media. And so I want to talk about what is a wet market and what would you see if you were there. Um, and while I was in China, I had a chance to interview some of the key scientists who had fought against another coronavirus, SARS, back in 2003. So that's sort of the background that shapes my interest of what I'm going to cover in the talk. And the first thing that I want to talk about is where this virus uh, came from. Uh, and the short answer is we don't really have a full answer yet. There's some controversy, but we do know that this virus seems to be closely related to a virus that's already circulating in the wild in horseshoe bats. And we know that most uh, epidemics are zoonoses in which the animal pathogens make a jump to people. Some of you may have read uh, David Quammen's Spillover, which talks about that brilliantly. Um, it is very common for bats to be um, the source of emerging epidemic uh, diseases. Um, it maybe in part because they live in such large colonies, but very often, not always, but often the viruses in bats have to passage through another animal. So that was the case, for example, in 2003 with SARS, where some uh, research has suggested that the virus passed through an animal called a civet cat. Um, so this virus probably had um, natural origins and was able to jump because of two people because of something called wet markets. And what a wet market is, is a 
it, it reminds me a lot actually of the farmer's markets in uh, Portland. It is a market where you can go, you can purchase an animal, it will be killed and cleaned and given to you uh, right on the spot. And these are quite popular in China, in part because there's pretty lax regulation of the food system. There have been a number of food scandals. Uh, for example, in 2008, they found melamine in uh, baby formula. Um, more recently, there's also been some scandals involving fake vaccines. Um, so there's been a number of examples like that. So people like to buy their food fresh. They like to um, see the chicken or whatever animal they're buying. Um, and I spent, oh, I spent a summer, a good part of a summer in Hong Kong. And what I did was to try to visit as many wet markets as possible um, during that time. Now in Hong Kong, the wet markets are pretty tightly regulated. So I was particularly interested in poultry because there had been examples of avian influenza, small outbreaks starting with poultry. So I was um, looking at that. Um, what is interesting is that in 2003, there was another coronavirus, SARS, and that outbreak started, uh, according to the best information we have, probably in a wet market. And the live animal trade was temporarily banned after that in China, but then the rules were relaxed. And to me, it's very frustrating because I think that it's very likely this is where this particular viral outbreak began. And it's difficult uh, to kind of think about how much suffering and um, uh, economic loss could have been avoided if the wet markets had stayed closed. Um, and, and what's interesting to me is that the Chinese government did not keep them closed. They made a choice to, to keep them uh, open. And one of the arguments that you do hear about wet markets is that they're an essential part of Chinese culture. So it would be very difficult to close them. But other Asian countries like Japan and Taiwan also historically had the same markets and decide to, to close these down. If you were to go to most of these markets, um, you would see not only birds being sold, but in mainland China, you would also see mammals. Um, and these animals are being sold both for food, but also for use in um, traditional Chinese medicine. For example, you may have heard that pangolins, which are a very funny sort of animal that's covered in scales, might uh, possibly, we don't know, have been one of the intermediary hosts for this virus. And these animals are uh, endangered. They are being brought from places like Malaysia, and then they're being, have been sold in markets in China where their uh, scales are roasted and used for skin conditions. So it's not only that these animals are being used for food, they're also being used for medicine. Um, there's legislation under review in China right now that would ban wild animals from wet markets. Um, we'll see how that moves forward. There's been a lot of unhelpful rhetoric about wet markets by US politicians and others, which is creating sort of a backlash. Um, but public health workers for a long time have been worried about these wet markets and the risks that they posed, which is why I went and did work there, why so much work has been done in these markets. But I, I want to turn from talking a little bit about the likely origins of the virus. It probably came from a wet market. And I want to talk a little bit about conspiracy theories because I've spent a lot of uh, my time over the last 10 years thinking about epidemics and conspiracy theories. And one of the things that's interesting to me about conspiracy theories is that you'll find people um, who believe them, who are successful, articulate, and educated. Um, but these theories always emerge during a pandemic. And that's been true since 1348 and the bubonic plague, when Jews in Europe were scapegoated and attacked for the uh, outbreak. 
Um, and so as I started looking and writing articles out uh, about these conspiracy theories, it was interesting to see how many of them focused on blaming a particular group for the outbreak, which is usually some uh, group that's uh, an outsider in some ways and that is viewed negatively by the majority community. For example, during the H1N1 uh, influenza pandemic that some of you may remember from 2009, uh, people in Egypt, religious leaders in Egypt, blamed the Christian Copt community for the outbreak. And they said that the entire nation of Egypt was at risk because the Christians had pigs and that the pigs had to be slaughtered. And that actually was carried out, which really had a, a great economic influ uh, impact on the Christian community in Egypt and also caused a lot of problems for garbage uh, collection but there never was any threat uh, posed by pigs. Um, there are so many examples uh, that are similar. During H1N1 in 2009 in the United States, there was um, a lot of discussion on conservative radio and media channels about how this was a threat being brought from Mexico. Uh, it, the issue was linked to illegal immigration what was interesting to me was that in Mexico, there was a belief that this uh, was uh, a virus that had been brought from the United States. In fact, one of the theories was that it had been created in a lab in the United States, which was supposedly owned by Donald Rumsfeld, which is, I'll get back to it in a minute. Um, so it was sort of interesting that in 2009, you saw both sides of the border in North America pointing fingers in the other direction. Um, and I'll just mention maybe one more example of this sort of tendency, which was with um, Zika, which began, I think it was around 2017. There were a lot of conspiracy theories um, being advanced in Brazil, Peru, Mexico about that outbreak. And I looked at those conspiracy theories on Reddit and YouTube and blogs and WeChat, uh, WhatsApp groups, I mean, and there were, they often blamed uh, a lab in the United States. Um, and they also often pointed to Bill Gates and the Illuminati. Uh, Bill Gates comes up a lot. I don't know what it is about poor Bill Gates. Um, nobody seems to be pointing the finger at Jeff Bezos, but Bill Gates is in a lot of these theories. Um, and what you probably start to notice is that there's a lot of commonalities in these conspiracy theories. There's often a bioweapons lab. Um, people often point to pharmaceutical companies, Monsanto, uh, the Illuminati, and Bill Gates. I can pretty much guarantee you they're going to be mentioned in any conspiracy theory. And I think that there's reasons why these same beliefs are recycled time after time. I think that what really frightens people is the idea that an epidemic is random, that it's just something that occurs naturally. I think it's less frightening to think that there is someone dangerous who's done this, that if you can kind of identify a person or a group that's behind it, you can respond in some way in a, uh, that perhaps makes you feel powerful. So these theories often target powerful but distant groups and they kind of provide uh, a focus for people to uh, blame. So let's talk for a few minutes about the conspiracy theories about COVID-19. There are um, three locations that I really want to focus on because they're the places that have had the most cases. So the United States, China, and Europe. And if you, if you look at these conspiracy theories, one popular one in the United States is that it was created in a secret Chinese research lab. And I'm going to assume that most of you have heard this uh, theory, whether it's because you read it in the New York Times or someone has mentioned it, it's been in the news, people have been talking about it on CNN. Um, and as is often the case with many of these theories, there's 
just a little grain of truth to it in that there really is um, a research lab in China. It's doing work on coronaviruses, which is not surprising since they did have experience with uh, coronavirus in um, 2003 with SARS. Um, Chinese scientists have been publishing their work on this. And um, there's uh, been some media coverage that suggests that in 2018, some US officials visited the lab and were concerned about safety conditions. Now, we're gonna know a great deal more about the origins of this particular pandemic uh, in the near future as, as more work is done. Um, is it possible that it's such an ac accident happened? Well, it's hard to disprove it. The people at the lab have denied it. And I don't know of any epidemiologists or virologists or public health officials who, who particularly believe this. We already know that this virus uh, exists in nature. It's in horseshoe bats. Um, we haven't identified the intermediary species, although there's been some media coverage around the idea that it might have been pangolins. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that this virus has been modified in a lab. Um, and if you want to know more, there's a great paper in Nature by Andrew Rambo and his colleagues called The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. I'll just read the opening line. Our analyses clearly show that SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct or a purposefully manipulated virus. So um, there, there's a lot of variations on this theme. Um, I think that the idea that perhaps this was the result of a lab accident um, has endured in part because it gets back to the fact that this wasn't something random. And if this were true, it would be an act of criminal negligence by Chinese authorities. And, and people like to believe that these uh, events aren't random. Of course, then in China, there's a theory about the United States, very similar to what happened between Mexico and the United States in 2009. Um, so in China, nationalists have created their own counter theory that the virus originated in the United States um, and was introduced by some visiting military personnel uh, last November. And this is something that a Chinese foreign ministry uh, member, Zhao Lijian, has been advocating for in different venues. I believe he's been on Twitter promoting that belief. Um, and what I would want to say about that is this belief has been echoed in other places. For example, it's been picked up in Iran, which decided not to accept uh, a US offer of support and reference the theory when doing so. So there's a, what I would describe as a global battle to control the narrative about this virus. But I think the strangest theory is really powerful in Europe. And it's about 5G networks, which permit ultra fast wireless. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I'm sure there are people uh, here who know much more about 5G than I do. But you may have read a little bit about this theory in the New York Times. It has been spread by a group of celebrities, including an R&B singer. Um, and it seems to have its greatest influence in Britain, where there have been over 30 attacks on cell phone towers, uh, many of which have been burned. Um, and what's ironic to me is these theories uh, and narratives are spreading through Facebook and other kind of social media that does depend on uh, data. Um, the one thing that's interesting to me is it echoes all conspiracy theories. There's actually a video going around on YouTube that you can find that says that um, this particular outbreak, COVID-19, is happening now because of 5G in the same way that in the 1918 pandemic happened because of radio waves and the 1968 flu took place uh, because of satellites. So it's interesting to me, again, how these theories are recycled and they reflect popular fears, particularly uncertainty about social and technological change. Um, and I, I don't have too much time, but I wanna read one quote from the great historian Alfred Crosby, who was talking about 
syphilis in his wonderful book, The Columbian Exchange. And what Crosby said was that when syphilis appeared at the end of the 15th century, the very name given to the disease emphasized the fact that it came from somewhere else. So I have a, a quote here, and Crosby described the fact that, quote, the Italians called it the French disease, the French called it the disease of Naples, the English called it the French disease, the Bordeaux disease, or the Spanish disease. The Poles called it the German disease. Russians called it the Polish disease. The Middle Easterners called it the European pustules. The Indians called it the disease of the Western Europeans. The Japanese called it the Portuguese disease. So it seems to be human nature to ascribe blame for disease and the best person to blame would seem to be a foreigner. I want to take the last two to three minutes and just talk about what we do know. The outbreak started with sustained transmission, perhaps in late November or early December of 2019. Local authorities in Hubei did not respond well at first. They hosted a huge banquet. Um, indeed, there were a small group of doctors who started to share information about this on social media, one of whom uh, well, several of whom were actually uh, brought into the police station and given warnings, one of whom later went on to die and become something of a martyr. Even so, um, even so, um, news about the virus spread pretty quickly. And uh, the last point that I want to talk about is that what's interesting to me is that nations like Vietnam and Thailand, which are relatively poor, have done a pretty amazing job controlling this virus. And these are countries that had a lot of tourism early on from China. And South Korea has also done a very uh, good job getting an outbreak under control. Um, and I think that's because they have really focused on testing and contact tracing. Whereas a lot of other nations, including in Western Europe and the United States, there's been more focus on borders and travel. Um, now, I'm giving this talk in April of 2020, so a lot may change in the next few weeks. We can see what's happening in Singapore right now, which at first controlled the outbreak very well and where numbers are now surging. But I, I would like to close by saying that I think that one of the fundamental problems has been hubris, that the US and Europe assume that because of their technology and their wonderful hospitals, that this wouldn't happen the same way here, and that they didn't have anything to learn perhaps from China and Taiwan. And if we're gonna move forward, I think that uh, we need to focus public discourse away from blame and to learn more from the examples of nations that have done the best job containing the virus. So, you know, if we're going to uh, move forward, we almost need a change in mindset. I know that this has been a very quick talk, but I'm really interested in hearing people's questions. Uh, please remember, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I will do my best. Uh, and I look forward to uh, answering some of them. Thank you. So, Sean, this is the uh, disembodied voice of Tim DeRoche. Hi, Tim. Um, how are you? Thanks for the uh, fantastic talk. Um, I'm curious, uh, when we look at conspiracy theory and sort of um, alternate narratives, oftentimes that rhetoric is a bottom-up uh, uh, phenomenon. So how do we reconcile a bottom-up phenomenon meeting a top-down phenomenon that is engaging those same um, pieces of misinformation and rhetoric? And have you seen have you seen the situations where um, that you know either social science or reason I mean it's a wonderful thing um, are able to reconcile some of those issues? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of work done by um, uh, psychologists on how to persuade people who hold conspiracy theories. And the first thing I would say is that all the research shows that reasoned debate is not going to work because for the diehard conspiracy theorists, there's always going to be some explanation for a counterfactual example. 
But the good news is we don't need to uh, uh, convert or persuade those people because that small group is uh, not really the core of the issue. It's their ability to magnify their voice on social media. And one thing that's been shown to work well is when local authority figures, people that are trusted, uh, speak. And one of the challenges is I think that doctors, religious figures, uh, local community leaders may be a little reluctant to talk about conspiracy theories because they just think it's too ridiculous. I'm not going to take the time to um, address that. But when you see examples of public health campaigns that have worked really well, I think it's often because they get those religious figures, they get the people in the churches or the mosques or the synagogues to speak, they get local doctors to speak. Um, and often if it's a person who has sort of a one-on-one -on -one connection with the person, those people can be far more effective persuading people. So from the standpoint of expertise, we seem to have a deficit of belief in experts at this point. Tom Nichols wrote a great book a couple of years ago on the death of expertise. Uh, are you and your colleagues looking at the sort of trend of distrust in um, experts and, and um, you know, the, the role of science in public policy? Yeah, this is something that people have been wrestling with um, for quite a while. And it's, it's a big issue in the um, effort to um, uh, fight the anti-vax community in particular. Um, and one of the concerns that I think we have is, uh, I, I saw a poll recently on how many people would take a vaccine if a vaccine for COVID were discovered tomorrow. And you would assume that it would be fairly high. And uh, as I remember, most Americans said they would take it, but it was still a substantial fraction who said they wouldn't. Um, so these um, conspiracy theories and beyond that, that kind of mistrust of health authorities and health experts, it is a real problem. And it's something that I think that the medical community can't resolve alone. So we've got a, <clears throat> pardon me, we've got a question from Kevin Crowley. Um, he says, it seems that SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, has mutated multiple times in the five months since the outbreak began. Do you know what the mutation rate is in nature? for coronaviruses, and Kevin, bear in mind, he is not a scientist, although he plays one on Zoom TV. Um, <laughs> but have other similar mutations been found among the horseshoe bat population? Mm. I don't know the answer to horseshoe bats. Um, what I might talk about a little bit um, is the question of mutations in other viruses, because what that can do is make it more difficult to create a vaccine. For example, people have been trying since the early 80s to create a vaccine for HIV AIDS and not with much success so far. So, um, you know, the question of the mutation rate of the virus is an important one because that would impact things like vaccines. Um, I definitely am not an expert in that literature. Uh, most of the publications that I have seen have suggested that the level of mutation isn't enough to really um, cause significant challenges so far. Um, uh, I did see that there was one new article out about the mutation right today, today but I'm not an expert enough to um, really speak to that. What I can say is for most of what I've heard from sort of public health colleagues is that they seem to get a little frustrated about this question, that they, they feel that people think that there'll be a mutation, there'll be a dramatic change in the behavior of the virus, which they seem to think isn't so likely. But again, I am not a scientist, so I, I should be very cautious what I say. Um, thinking about uh, sort of large scale public health campaigns, I mean, you mentioned how uh, Korea was doing, how, how Singapore was doing, and there's, there's been an uptick. Uh, I think about, I went to a great program that um, OHSU Global Health did last year on Thailand and the uh, massive family planning campaign that was very bottom up, very grassroots, that over a, about a 20 year period took the, um, the birth rate from something like 6.9 kids down to like 1.4. Can you think of any other, <clears throat> any other campaigns that have 
really engaged um, a populace with a good end result in, in, from your studies? Yeah, I think one of the places where you really see excellent work having been done was around polio. Now, polio is not eradicated. It is still in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Uh, I'm forgetting there's a third country. But over the last 10 years, there's been absolutely amazing work to fight polio. Um, and, you know, the people who are giving polio vaccine, if you look at who's doing it in places like Pakistan, it's often been women because it's easier for them to go into the home. They have faced violence. Um, there are people who have been killed. And what they've done is that they have reached out to um, local religious authorities, uh, people who inspire trust. And there's much more work to be done. But what's amazing is how much progress has been made by very brave people working under really difficult um, um, circumstances. One thing I will say is that there's a number of countries that have done really well, like New Zealand, for example, is trying to literally stamp out the virus. A couple days ago, I saw um, uh, a piece on Taiwan, which did not have a single new case that day. So there are countries that are really managing it quite well. And I, I think we have a lot to learn from them. Okay, so Ron has a question for you. Do you have any thoughts about opening up businesses again and the risks of doing that too soon? Yeah, you know, there's a huge debate about this and people take a look at examples like Sweden where people have, they, they have done quite a bit to, to flatten the curve. They have do, done quite a bit around social isolation, but they've been relying more on kind of people's individual choices. I think that in order for the United States to be able to open up, um, we are going to need to be much further along with testing where we are. And the best way of kind of telling how close we are to that, again, I'm definitely not a scientist, but looking at the positive rate, and if you are seeing that the number of people who are being tested for COVID-19, um, who are at, ultimately testing positive is 18, 20%, we're too far away from where we can do that. We need to get the um, rate uh, of positive tests down. We need to have better contact tracing and a lot's happening. You may have seen, I believe it was in the New York Times today, that there's a discussion about hiring at least 100,000 contact tracers, which are the people that when somebody falls sick, will talk to them, get a list of everybody that they've talked to um, and move forward. So at some point we need to open up but there's a lot uh, that has to happen before we're there in terms of testing, um, better testing equipment so that more tests can be given at the point where the test is taken, more contact tracing. Um, so I don't think it's going to happen in the next few weeks without seeing a big surge. And many people may have seen that there were examples of this happening in 1918, where cities would shut down, there were difficult economic costs that would open up again only to see another surge of the virus. So here's an interesting question and it kind of points to I think one of the challenges we have in this in this age of polarization of how do we talk to people who don't believe or agree with us and um, uh, Robert wants to know that you know you mentioned anti-vaxxers um, and he says I don't know how to talk to my friends that feel that way without alienating them and do you have any suggestions? Yeah, that is a very difficult question because I think we all have that experience. We all probably know someone who has some belief. Um, I think that, and this is what's hard, that if it is placed into the context of politics at that point, and this is my personal opinion, it becomes very difficult to have any kind of a conversation. And so if I had one wish for these debates, if they could be depoliticized right now, and if uh, information could be coming from public health professionals and kind of taken out of the, the political sphere. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think that if you can do it in a way that is challenging um, their belief on only this point and not their larger worldview, and where you're able to give them evidence but not confront them in the moment, that's more likely than if you have a debate. If you get into an argument I don't think it's very likely you'll have a lot of success. This is very hard to do. 
you know, we had a um, wonderful climate scientist a few years ago speak for our international speaker series, uh, Catherine Hayhoe. And she was, I think, a, a little bit of a challenge for some of the audience because she was a climate scientist and an evangelical Christian, but she didn't mm -hmm. see the two in conflict. And she was really good at talking about what do we know versus what we believe. And she also was very good at talking about what is the difference between weather and climate, for instance. Mm -hmm. But she would say, when people ask me if I believe in climate change, I would say, no, I do not, because it's not up for debate. She said, I believe in God. And I found that to be a really interesting dynamic that she could, she could be a woman of science and a woman of faith simultaneously. And it, you know, it, it's, I think it can be very difficult to hold that sort of paradox in your hands. So, um, uh, but I mean, we're in a moment where fear, I believe, is um, making us prey to misinformation often. And um, so it's, it's hard to take a step back sometimes. Um, so Casey uh, has a question here. How do epidemics like this generally end? And what prevented previous ep epidemics from continuously having large infectious rates? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, if you look at 1918, which is, I know you're going to have a, a talk at World Organ shortly, and I, I think that it's really good to do so because that's the most similar event in the last uh, little over 100 years. If you looked at that uh, particular case, there were three waves to the pandemic. Um, and that often doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, and I'm going to say something that isn't going to be very popular, but I don't think this is going to end very quickly if by ending you mean that everybody goes back entirely to a normal life. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think it's going to be frustrating. Um, I think that people are going to have to change their behavior for a long time. It would be wonderful if we had a vaccine in the near future. But I also that remember when the um, Secretary of Health under Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s gave a, one of the first press conferences about HIV AIDS and was asked about uh, how soon will a vaccine be ready? And I think her answer was, I, I can't remember exactly, but like six months to a year. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that vaccines are really difficult historically to create and there are some diseases where people have been trying for a very long time. So we may be lucky and perhaps it will be that a vaccine could be created, but I think it would probably be a year or so out, even in a, a really good say, case scenario, in the sense where it would be something that would be available for everyone and not just for doctors and first responders. I would love to prove wrong. You know, it's April 2020 and I would love to see me be completely wrong. I think that what is more likely to help us early on is if we can find effective therapies. Can we find a drug that is already in production that can be used for this? Um, but I suspect that things will open up kind of gradually. Um, I've been talking, I have, I have colleagues in uh, China and people focus a lot on China's early experience, but what's most interesting to me right now is what's happening in China. Kids are going back to school. They've, um, I have um, someone I know there who graduated from PSU, is now teaching middle, uh, middle school in China. Her students are coming back and they all wear masks and the desks are placed uh, far apart from each other. They don't turn the air conditioning on because they're afraid about air circulation. Um, so I, I think that before we really get back to normal, it's going to be quite a while, but I do think that we'll find ways to start to open up to some extent. So, Sean, you are, you're a social scientist, but you're also a parent. And we've been having a lot of conversations just about um, caring for our mental health and thinking about um, many of our coworkers have, have kids. How do you think this is going to affect, I mean, I think about my parents who were depression era parents and how that period of time informed sort of the worldview and their, their approach to living the rest of their lives. If you're like say five to 10 years old and you have to wash your hands and stay away from people and you can't play with your friends, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but how do you think societally this is going to affect that 
that group of, of young people? I think that's a really good question. And I think that one thing that's hard is that these kids have had so much taken away from them already. On the one hand, yes, you know, the great, I don't know if blessing's the right word, or, uh, word for it, but you don't see high mortality rates with children, which is, uh, thank God. But, you know, uh, my children uh, have had to come home and are doing classes online. Um, I think that one of the things that is going to change is that even though uh, I think most kids want to get back face to face, they're going to have new online skills and online will grow greatly because of this. But what's interesting to me is I want to jump back to 1918 and it would be interesting to hear what your next speaker would say. But one thing that was interesting about that was that people have said that that was the forgotten epidemic. There's been a lot of coverage over the last 15 to 20 years but right after the epidemic, people sort of wanted to forget about it. They didn't talk about it that much. Um, and then, so it was sort of rediscovered later by historians. It's not like people ever completely forgot about it, but you didn't see it talked about in public as much. I'm thinking that this will change, but it's just sort of a little uh, note from history that we can't predict how people are going to remember it or if they want to remember it. So we've got a couple more questions here. Um, so speaking of climate and a comparison to 1918 and COVID-19, uh, there are 10-year storms and 100-year storms. Is there a pattern of pandemic outbreaks, say, every X number of years? That is such a good question. I always like to compare epidemics to earthquakes. This isn't my analogy. Other people came up with this. You can, you can know when it's happening. Maybe you can see some signs that there's an increased risk, but trying to predict a pandemic is like trying to predict an earthquake. Um, I think that what you have to do is to look at the public policy choices. And of course, that's my interest, so I would say it, that there are things that can be done that could really make a difference. If the wet markets were um, shut down, in China and there were no longer, and by shut down, I mean that wild animals were no longer being transported, sold, killed there. That would make a significant difference. Unfortunately, I think a lot of the warning signs are not very good right now. If you look at avian influenza clades in southeastern China, they've been, um, there's been an increase in the number of clades. There's been a lot of small, um, outbreaks where somebody will be handling poultry and get infected. So there's simply no way to predict it. We could go another hundred years before we experience something like 1918, or it could happen very quickly. So I have a question from Anessa here. Um, she's concerned that governments and health experts are not promoting how to stay healthy during quarantine or prime our bodies and strengthen our immune systems. And um, there's a lot we could be doing for ourselves right now and in the future. Um, and as she says, and I think that this is an echo for a lot of us, um, the news is making us sick or sicker. So in terms of talking about, you know, sort of larger systems, um, and I think that she, make, she makes a great point, our public health and health systems seem set up for, to fight illness and not prevent disease. So do you see our health system changing? And I'm going to add to that. What type of leadership is it going to take to see that happen? Boy, that is such a great question. I'm not sure that I'm the right person in all ways to answer it. But, you know, I think one of the things that it gets back to is basic public health. You know, over the last 40 years, we have disinvested so much in public health. You know, the number of nurses in schools. I don't know about you, but I can remember the nurse in my uh, middle school and high school. A lot of that's gone away. And so a lot of those resources haven't been there. And I do think it's a fair point to say that we've got to look at the bigger picture, not only all of the time, but also during a time like this. I mean, the, there's so much pressure on people's mental health. Um, I also think that that's got to inform public health decisions. For example, um, it would be a very good thing if people continue to go outside. I, I do read about places where people aren't allowed to go uh, outside at all except to go to the grocery store and the pharmacy so that people aren't allowed to take walks and that kind of thing. 
And I think if we're going to be making public health decisions, we have to speak and think directly about that point. And um, it's a good point too, to think about how much need, news you really need to have. You know, this is a, uh, a point where living in my family with me is probably not a good thing because early on in the outbreak, I'd always want to talk about the latest piece of news about COVID-19. And then I was told that we would have a news break. And I think that was a very constructive thing. So I think every family has to wrestle with that a little bit, but it, we do need to have a plan for it. And we do need to think about how to take care of not just but our family members, but also ourselves. You know, I like that you brought up the, um, the corollary between earthquakes and this, because I was actually thinking about this yesterday. I'm sure many of the people who were on the call uh, read Catherine Schwartz's incredible uh, piece in the New Yorker a couple of years ago on the next big one. And I thought about that in terms of uh, especially this region, you know, we look at the coast, we look at some of these areas, you know, early on, the coastal town said, please don't come here. You've got a lot of people who are older and retired. We've got vulnerable populations. And when you think about the larger infrastructure issues of the next big one, whether that be an earthquake or a pandemic, uh, it forced, I think, um, a long view way of thinking that we're just, we're sort of not prepared for and do you think that this is going to change both, you know, local and regional approaches? I mean, we're seeing this with the agreement between Washington, Oregon, and California. Do you think we're going to see a, a change in sort of regional thinking? Yeah, it's been really interesting seeing these different um, organizations sort of spring up, you know, sort of the Western PAC, and you see New, uh, New York and New England coming together to think about how to... Um, deal with this, which I think speaks to larger political issues. But one of the things that happens, and this isn't my idea, but people have often said, you know, public health um, does take money, but what's really expensive is not having an effective public health system. And I do think that, you know, you were asking about what's going to change. I think that that's going to be one. I think that we will be better prepared. And I suspect that's one of the reasons that some Asian countries have done better, uh, even Canada, because they had an experience in 2003 that persuaded them to really invest in infrastructure and people to deal with health situations. Um, I spent some time in southeastern China in 2017 talking to people um, about what had changed since SARS. And one of the things is that in China um, and other some other nations that were affected, they really invested. They created world, um, they created um, health centers that are really dedicated to research on that. They invested in all kinds of technology. They invested in labs. And so I suspect we're going to, that will be one of the enduring changes, I hope, from this epidemic. So we've got time for one more question. We, we, you've been talking about what will change. Um, Marta wants to know, um, people keep talking about how the world will, quote, change forever, and to quote, as a result. So as a social scientist, in what ways do you think the world will change? And if people seem to forget about the 1918 pandemic, do you think the same thing will happen with the 2020 pandemic? Yeah, I've been thinking about just that question. And it seems to me that part of the reason, as Al Alfred Crosby said, that the 1918 pandemic was forgotten, was that it came right at the end of World War II. And people had been through very difficult years and made great sacrifices. The war was ending. They didn't want to remember. They wanted to, to put it behind them. And if I had to guess, and I don't have a crystal ball, I think that people will remember this differently. I think it's a different time, especially with social media. I think that, um, the fact that we have technologies that we didn't have in 2000 that allow us to do this Zoom call, that have allowed us to kind of adapt to it, um, is going to make us remember because we picked up skills and um, the ability to do things that we couldn't have done before this. So if I had to guess, I would say that we'll remember. And I think that people will be more likely to work remotely, or at least part of the time. I think that even though kids will be very happy to go back to school, there will be more online classes. And I think that one outcome of this is that the entire 
digital revolution is going to be pushed forward because it is it has allowed us to keep the economy going and to keep doing things like this talk that we're having today in a way that wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. That's fantastic. Thank you so very much, Sean. I'm going to uh, throw it back into Derek's lap, who's going to uh, close out the program. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. And thank you for tuning in. It is, it's so wonderful to, you know, in essence, be forced into this, into this platform, but it's, it is an incredible opportunity to keep us connected on some of the bigger issues and find ways to navigate, um, you know, all the big questions that I think both challenge and inspire us as individuals, as a community, as a culture. So um, thanks again. And Derek, it's all yours. Thanks, Tim. Uh, great job uh, managing the, the Q&A. And thanks for the fabulous questions from our audience. A couple notes on our upcoming programs. As uh, Sean said, we have what should be a dynamite uh, presentation by Chris McNichols. Uh, excuse me, Christopher Nichols of OSU talking about uh, what we can learn from the influenza pandemic of 1918. That's on for Thursday. It is sold out because we have maxed in our Zoom use. We are uh, looking for options for future programs. We will have larger audience, but just a good reminder, interest to you to sign up quickly because some of them literally do sell out. Uh, we have a brand new program that Tim is putting the final touches on. We will announce Wednesday in our e-news. Uh, about combating extreme, extremism and hate coming up on Monday, the 25th at noon with some local experts. That should be a great one. And we have a lot more that we're working on. So stay tuned. Derek, Derek that's the 27th. Yes. Oh, that's I'm sorry. Excuse me. The 27th coming up. Uh, yes. Excuse me. The 27th coming up. Uh, thanks, Tim, for the clarification. And I would just again ask you, if you are not already a member, to please uh, become a member, renew your membership. Consider making a donation. You can do so at worldoregon.org. We need your support to uh, keep a uh, vibrant program going in this challenging circumstances. So thanks for joining us today. And again, a huge thanks, Sean, for your fantastic presentation and Q&A. Thank you very much, everyone. I really enjoyed it. All the best. We'll see you at the next virtual program.